All right. So welcome everyone who's joining us um, today for our, our <coughs> repertoire roundtable for WASB. We have the Blue Dot Collective. Um, so included in this collective, we have Jennifer Jolly. Say hi, Jennifer. Uh, we have Omar Thomas. Hello. We have David Biedenbender. Hi. We have Roger Zare. Hi. We have Benjamin Dean Taylor. So good to be here, guys. We have Jess Langsterner. Hello, everybody. And we have Viet Quang. Hi. So, um, what we're going to do today is we're going to start with a couple of questions. Um, and then uh, we're just going to kind of see where it goes and let these guys talk. But just one quick comment for everyone who's joining us, please make sure that you keep your microphone muted uh, so that uh, you can speak freely and be heard. So uh, if you have questions at any point, feel free to put them in the chat uh, and we'll try and get those included as well. So uh, to get this ball rolling, um, why don't we just start? Because uh, you all are composers of super diverse backgrounds and interests and come from different compositional worlds. Let's just go ahead and start with what brought you to writing music for the wind thing. Maybe we take it in order that we were in introduced. <laughs> I guess that means I go first. Sure. Um, yeah, you all play my music, so thank you. <laughs> exactly why. Um, but seriously though, um, I remember when I was a freshman in college and my composition teacher was like, always go to, um, wind ensemble concerts because they always play new music and I've just been going to every single wind concert I can go to as far as I, I knew. So that's how I got started. Uh, I, I guess my, my kind of thing is that I uh, um, am primarily in the jazz world and just I've been playing wind ensemble since I was in fourth grade into college and, um, and had some of my most meaningful experiences in the medium and, um, but also noticed that there was just kind of a, a lack of repertoire from uh, certain cultural perspectives. And so that's just kind of why I decided to jump in because like Jennifer said, this is a, a medium that embraces new music and new ideas. So, so it, it, it made sense. For me, I got my, uh, my start musically really in band. Uh, started playing trumpet and I was terrible and uh, switched to the euphonium, as is a common pathway for euphonium players, it seems. Um, and, uh, you know, my first experiences with, uh, with a, a composer uh, was in my high school band when David Gillingham came in and worked with us. Um, we played new music all the time. Um, and it's where I first started doing arranging. Arranging led to composing. And so band is really where I got my start. Um, in terms of why I'm still here, I echo Jen and, and Omar's sentiments that some of my most meaningful musical experience are in this medium and, um, and you all support my work um, and you love to collaborate and play new music and there's, you know, just this active attitude of cultivating um, new repertoire. So it's a, it's a place and a space I like to be. Yeah, and I'll, I'll echo all of that as well. I, I love working with people who are really interested in innovating and doing new things and, and um, pushing the medium. And I remember when I was a freshman uh, at USC, so how many years after you, Jen? <laughs> yeah, fight on. Um, let's say like, let's not count. Yeah, <laughs> we, we it was a long time ago. Let's just say that, yeah, okay. Um, but I remember John Mackey visited because Redline Tango uh, was becoming a big thing and Bob Reynolds uh, programmed it and he talked about that and it really rubbed off on me and like what could be possible i come from the orchestra world myself i'm a pianist and a violinist and really wanted to write for orchestra and then just seeing what was possible with the wind ensemble medium uh was so fantastic uh and eye-opening for me that i really wanted to stick with it and uh, be a part of that world as well was it me <laughs> well i attend did my first uh, wind ensemble concert at the age of seven weeks old um, because my father is a <laughs> college band director. Uh, apparently, I slept through the whole thing. And, um, but basically, I probably didn't miss one of my dad's band concerts uh, probably for about 25 years. Um, and I ended up playing in that same wind ensemble when 
when I um, started playing trumpet. Um, yeah, and it was a fantastic group. And then um, I got interested in writing music and that sound was just kind of constantly in my head, you know, those timbres. And it was just kind of, I guess, natural for me. And then plus what um, Omar and Dave both said, there's performance opportunities, actually. You don't get a reading and then <laughs> never get to hear it again. Uh, you know, you'll have groups practice for a month and then do a stellar, you know, performance. So, yeah, it just made sense to me. I can't remember. Am I next to you yet? <laughs> I, um, I, well, so I come at this from a, a, I'm a jazz trumpet player. And I mean, in high school, I was playing in a Foo Fighter cover band and I was <laughs> writing tunes. I was playing bass for uh, a ska band and writing the tunes for that. Um, I, I would have never thought I'd be writing music for orchestras and wind bands. Uh, why am I doing it? Well, I, for me, I, uh, it's all about the community and the people. I, I mean, I love making music, absolutely. And I love how music can bring people together in a way that no other activity can. So, I mean, for example, I, I, I ran cross country and track in high school. I have no idea where my fellow cross country guys are, but a bunch of the band guys that I was with, I'm still friends with them. I'm still very much in touch with them. So there's something about music. I, I, I'm preaching to the choir here, but that's why I'm here. It's because of that connection that music brings. Thanks. That's preaching to the band. Get it right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I echo what everyone here has said as well, but uh, I, I was like a pianist from a young age. Pianist, I was forced to play piano, but um, when I got to middle school, I learned, I was like a percussionist because then they didn't have to teach me where the notes all were. Um, and band was really where like, as a very insecure teenager where I, found my place was like in the band room. So it's just a medium that I hold dear to my heart for that reason. And um, I got into composing just because I was counting so many rests when I wasn't playing like the bells parts. Um, and I would try go home and try to write music like Robert W. Smith and Robert Sheldon and everything. So it, like my composing all started from there with Finale Notepad. So I find it interesting that as you all are mentioning this, it, it's none of you, actually, I guess, Jess and, and David a little bit, but, but by and large, you're saying like, Roger, I, I, you know, I come from the orchestra background, or I, I, yeah, I started as a pianist. So I, I'm going to ask an uncomfortable question. Are you excited about, the, I mean, you all seem now very excited, and we love the music you're writing for our medium, but let's just say after the pandemic something weird happens and all of a sudden you have the opportunity to write full, full, full orchestra like all the time as well as band i mean would you would you be allured to that side or are you uh are you happy where you are i mean okay so um i technically did middle school band for three years i just don't let a lot of people know about it but now you all know and now it's on tape <laughs> So, um, you know, to be honest, I would say that as a composer, um, I mean, I think we'll take the gigs wherever we can take them. You know, we're just happy to work with people, or at least I'm just happy to work with people. Um, if a full orchestra asks me to write something for them, sure, I'll do it. But like, I mean, band's kind of like in my queue right now first, you know, I feel like there's just more enthusiasm. I feel like I could do a lot more experimentation. Um, and, uh, and I don't mean to bash orchestra, actually. I really love those colors and sounds. But um, I, I went actually to the League of American Orchestras conference last summer, met a whole bunch of new people. But it's just, it's kind of a different vibe where there are like, I think, they were expecting everybody there to be an orchestra administrator. And I was like, no, I'm a composer. And they're like, <laughs> like they needed a manual as to like how to talk with us, which um, I understand. I think we're all weird. So, and I'm also an academic. So it just further compounds the weirdness there and social, you know, weirdness. But um, anyways, no, I, I don't think we'd quit band. Like who would quit band? You know what I mean? Who would quit music? I just think that, you know, I, I'll write for whomever really just as long as it fits so. cool. is that a round table question as well however you want to do it i'm open to whatever 
Well, I, I'll just say really quickly that um, I had and I have a whole life outside of the band world. I was a big band guy. I've got big band albums. I have a big band. So, <laughs> so this kind of whole, you know, duality, binary between band and orchestra, it's like, you know, um, I, I write music for the ensembles that, you know, make the most sense for what it is that I'm trying to do. Um, and happens to be with, with big bands and with wind ensemble, but you know, um, whatever, maybe I'll hear something that needs, needs to be choral or, you know, and I'm open to all of those things. I'm just trying to get the music out. Yeah, I agree. Music is music and, you know, it depends what I'm writing for, whether it, it you know, sounds like one thing or another thing, but I also try to be really flexible with what I'm doing. And I've got so many pieces that I've written for one medium and then transcribed for another. Um, and I, I think that just helps the piece have a greater life um, if it can work that way. And of course, there are certain things that I would never transcribe because it's like I, I use this technique and this instrument and it's just not going to translate to any others. But um, yeah, if, if asked by orchestras and, and stuff, I, I love writing everything uh, from solo music to uh, give me a thousand people and I'll write for them too. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I would just echo what everybody else said. Like, we do take our gigs. Like, people people ask me, like, what I write for a lot of times. Like, who do you write for? I'm like, well, the person that's paying me money. <laughs> Usually, just <laughs> whatever pays me money. But, I mean, it goes deeper than that. Um, I think band is so ingrained into my musical upbringing, personally, that I don't think I could leave it behind. Um, but also, yeah, I love all the intense colors and just... Yeah, I, I kind of like not having that big string body to work with, you know. Um, extra challenge makes it extra fun. Uh, one one thing I'll, I'll quickly comment that um, I think Jen said was just that music is music. Or was it Roger? I, I don't know. I'm it's forgetting. Roger. I saw you gave the hand signals when. <laughs> so, I did. Um, uh, just one of the things that I think about a lot as a composition teacher and also just in terms of sustainability uh, in, in a career as a composer is that working in different mediums causes me to think differently about music. And so I say to myself and I say to my students that I'll write a better band piece if I've just written a choral piece and I'll write a better choir piece if I've written, if I've just written a string quartet and so on. And so I try to cultivate, um, my own uh you know my own writing process with that in mind that that thinking in different mediums even i mean you can even do that within a medium like different kinds of projects a, a large scale piece versus a short opener or something those kinds of pivots in your artistic process can enrich and and um deepen kind of your approach and cause you to think obliquely and, and those are the kinds of things i'm always interested in too is sort of that variety that keeps me on my toes toes artistically I really I'm agree with. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, yet. Yeah. <laughs> I I really agree with what Dave just said. Um, like, I I feel like my band music has gotten better over the years, not just because I've gotten older, <laughs> written more music, but because I've written for other um, mediums. And for a while, I focused a focused a lot on chamber music, and that really improved my um, my writing for band and something that I personally um, am wanting to do more in my band music is like bring communities together from different parts of the musical world, like bringing chamber ensembles into the band world and maybe vice versa, just from cross pollination. This is such a good conversation. <laughs> I'm so glad, Daryl, you brought us all together. Since we Blue Daughters, uh, we kind of only get together for Midwest and then other friendship things, uh, but it's so good to, to have this dialogue. Uh, the only thing I'll add is that, I think tangentially related to this question you asked, you know, why am I specifically writing for educational level ensembles, you know, middle school, high school, um, and not professional players? Hands down, I have had some of the most moving, uh, emotive musical experiences with kids. And I can't really explain that because sure, the professional, you know, orchestral performances I've enjoyed were great, like so technically on. And yet, and some of the mus middle school performances that I'm referring to, 
were not technically on, and yet there was, again, that ineffable connection of music was so much stronger there. So I, that's, what it, that's what brings me to this, this type of music. Maybe it helps that I'm you know, a youth pastor at my church and I enjoy interacting with teenagers <laughs> uh, and enjoy giving them some, uh, you know, something to hold on to. Like Viet said, you know, an instant community inside the band room or the orchestra where they can feel at home and feel meaning you know, and value as, as a contributing member of that community. So, yeah. So, so interestingly, there was a, uh, David Maslanka famously said that uh, when he studied with H.O. and Reed, um, that H.O. and Reed said, if you write more than one band piece, you're going to become a band composer. Um, does that worry any of you to be known as a band composer? I know, like, I know Jennifer, you've got your, your opera project. And I know, Omar, you have your, your big band, your jazz projects. Um, and you all write chamber and i've looked at i've heard a lot of music from a lot of you but the does it ever do you ever is that a concern in any way shape or form or i mean i think uh, it depends on oh go ahead oh no go go for it jen uh i was just going to share a story so i had this colleague at my last institution who was uh he he taught cs actually uh or computer science but they don't like that term and uh he's originally from indiana and he actually grew up with music ended up going to iu but did not major in music uh, and he called me a band queen and at first i'm like dude i'm not a band queen like what are you talking about um and then i was like well maybe i'm more like a band whore but i guess i can't say that but i just did um but you know what like who cares so what if i'm a band queen the only time i got pushback from that was like from an administrator and i think they were a composer whose music was not being performed anymore and i will stop it there i don't think we have to worry about that <laughs> sorry <laughs> um, well, here's, I mean, I've written more big man music than I've written win ensemble music. So does that same logic apply to me being a big, you know, I, I, I'll just define who I am. How about that? I will define who I am. You can throw any label at me that you want, but you know, I, I control that at the end of the day. So I'm really not worried about labels because as soon as you think I'm going to do one thing, maybe I'll do something completely different just because I want to. I love that. Yeah, I'm always trying to do something new. Every piece I write, I want to do at least one new thing. And so labels are problematic. And you know, if you ever talk to Steve Reich, don't bring up the word minimalism because you'll get a 30 minute lecture about how he hates labels. Um, and he hates that word. And you know, you can't control if other people are going to use labels, but they really don't go far enough to mean anything uh, at the end of the day. So uh, and you also can't control what other people are saying or doing. Um, you just have to be yourself. Uh, I totally agree. Well, I think your identity as a composer is determined by what you do, not by what people say about you. And there's a real tendency to kind of peg or, or put someone in a box um, because it's easier to kind of understand someone's identity. We do this. This is an issue well beyond music. Um, but you know identity is complicated and and as composers we've all talked about how and why we we make music in different um in different mediums in different communities and why those communities are vibrant and how they contribute to our artistic life how we contribute hopefully to those community communities so to me all of that's much more important and um you know the someone put in the comments about the inferiority complex um there is something there but you know i think it's important that um that music is music, you know, kind of like what Roger was saying, just that you write, you write what you write and, um, and you build community in those communities. Um, and don't worry about the rest. All right. Does anyone else want to chime into that one before I move on? Yeah, sorry, I forgot to unmute. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm new at this, I, I don't teach, so. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I actually did struggle a lot with the whole, like, being pigeonholed into band at first, uh, because I really loved writing choral music, like, a lot. Um, and, you know, I'd write a bunch of choral pieces, and they'd get performed once or twice, and, then, you know. Um, but I, I, I kind of, I, I won't say I made my piece 
with it because I still love writing for everything else. But I can do the same kinds of things in the wind ensemble that I can do in choral music. You know, you can write vocal lines and, and counterpoint and, and beautiful things like that. You can do almost anything you can do in an orchestra too. So, you know, even if I'm not getting commissions from these other, you know, types of ensembles, I'm still, you know, I'm still my own composer. The, the, the ensemble I'm composing for does not determine the music necessarily that comes out of me. Yeah, and you know, like, I will say that if someone calls you a band composer, I really don't care. Because I think, like Colleen mentioned, like the inferiority complex, I think that in the band world, there is this thread of like, what I call internalized bandophobia, where we're like, like, is this something we should be ashamed of? Like the band thing, like, but you know, like we're all just composers and we all have written for other things other than band and it's factual information on our websites, you know, like go to our websites, we have other things. <laughs> so it's like being called like a band composer, it's like, you know, it's, it's like one part of our identities, but it's not everything. And like, I just don't really take it that seriously. Ben, did you want to join in on that? One other quick thing I'll just say about, about this question. Um, we had talked about this, I think, at the last Midwest, just a little bit in the group. It's just, and it's something I tell my students sometimes, especially those that have not written a band piece before, and they sort of have this notion of what, of what that might sound like. And it's just that band is a medium, not a style. And I think that's a little bit of what is sometimes being leveraged is that like to be a band composer means to write music in a particular style. And that is the band style. Um, I would like to pretend I have no idea what that means. And I, and I definitely pretend that while I'm writing, <laughs> but I do know what they mean a little bit, you know, and I think that's some of the issue, right? It's this conflation of medium with a certain kind of sound world. Um, and I think, you know, I get, I, I hope this is true of my music. It's certainly something I can say about my colleagues in blue dot that, they have a, a sound uh, world that is, to me, well beyond any particular kind of style, and, and it's and it's personal and interesting and engaging, and that's why I'm in Blue Dot is because I like these people and what the, and the music they're making. <laughs> what, what Dave just said there is my entire modus operandi. I. Um, I once upon a time uh, wrote a band wrote a band piece that I hope none of you will ever hear. It certainly ain't on my website because I thought that's what this was supposed to be, you know? And I did all the stuff and the things that I thought was supposed to be in a band piece and it's fine and it's entirely forgettable. Um, and especially somebody who's coming from jazz background and trying to uh, navigate um, uh, uh, the translation kind of issues sometimes that I have. Um, I just, I finally gave myself to write the permission to write the music that I write. And I actually got that permission a long time ago from Maria Schneider because her music, if you say big band and then you play her music, those two things do not meld at all, especially some of her later stuff, you know? And she says the same thing when she, she says her music used to be so heavy and so kind of dark because that's what big band was when she really came out on the scene in the eighties. It was Thad Jones and it was, uh, it was uh, Bob Mincer and it's just these big, heavy sounds, and she, you know, her, the title track of her first album just starts with a bass, and there's a piano, and then there's a melody on a flute, and it's just like, you know, and so she had to give herself permission to write the music that she wrote, and I, I take that to heart, you know, um, to just do what you do, and to not think of Wind Ensemble as a genre, right? I think that that, that is such a grave, um, and I, I'll be honest with you, I still fight that sometimes when I'm sitting down to write a new, a new an ensemble piece, right? Um, I, to give my, I have to give myself permission every time I sit down to write a new piece to just do what I do, it's fine. That's awesome. So along these lines, since we're talking about um, allowing yourself to write um, along your own lines, um, right now, I know that some of you have been doing FlexBand. You've been involved with the Creative Repertoire Initiative. Um, writing flex bands. So um, 
I know that Jennifer has a piece. I know, Roger, you've converted some of your pieces. Um, Omar, I know you've got yours. Um, the title's escaping me, but the, the, that is a jazz. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sharp nine. Yeah, sharp nine. There we go. Thank you. And so um, did you find writing these new flex things, they, like, what kind of experience was it? What, uh, uh, Colleen Richardson, who's our president-elect for WASB, she was asking, how was the experience and were you surprised by the challenges that came with writing the flex piece? Jennifer, go. I feel like you have something to say. <laughs> You're muted, sis. I was going to say, like, I always have something to say. So um, <laughs> I feel, I don't know if I'm turning this into a confession, but I'll, I'll tell oh. you all um, where I'm coming. No, this is okay. I don't care. Well, this, this is how why I, I picked you to go first. There you go. <laughs> um, so actually, when I first started writing for band, um, I freaked out a little bit because it was like for large ensemble. I think I was always timid for writing for large ensembles to begin with. Like I didn't even write my first orchestra piece till I was 27. So uh, anyways, uh, and then I remember talking to an orchestra friend of mine who uh, was conducting band that was um, her rotation or for her load at her university. And she's like, you know what? I think there's a difference for writing for orchestra and and wind ensemble and I was very curious because again she comes from like an orchestral background and she said for band you don't really think about color and I was like wait what she's like you think about line and I know I know I'm getting looks you know, I'm getting looks and I will say this is not my opinion but like in a way it's freed me up because like as a composer I will never forget about color I feel like and Roger Zare can back me up like I feel like if you go to USC as an undergraduate you can't not think about color and you always have to think about crotales like I feel like that's our thing oh, yeah. <laughs> but like but thinking about the line like bringing it down to the line made it a little bit more freeing because then I can make the color decisions later so back on the whole like flex thing I feel like maybe I'm okay with having less choices. I don't know. Um, I also feel like I'm cheating. I'm not really like writing a new flex piece. If I had time, I'd probably do something more with like improvisation, but um, I'm almost done with uh, reworking my grade one last stage to Red Rock. And I don't know, I think maybe it's because I thought in line because I was like, well, I'm just writing for like middle schoolers anyway. And um, they were interested in being able to play a part. So it's like, and, and, and again, as like a former middle school flute player, I remember why I hated beginning band at first because they stuck you in that first octave and a hair I was already taking off the head joint and overblowing it and driving my mother crazy. So like orchestration doesn't really quite fit into like, into to look at grade one ensembles, right? But um, you still think about the line. And I remember the students there, they're like, well, I want to play a melody or a line and I want to pass it on to some other people. So um, I think probably my one concern, and I'll have to have one of you band directors look at it, is um, I'm afraid they're playing the line too much now because I only have three voices that uh, Brian Balma just said to do, especially with grade one. And so they're playing all the time. So now I'm afraid like their faces and their tiny mouths will fall off, but um, that might be the challenge. I will stop talking now, but anyways, <laughs> I think I think the, the idea is to think about the line. And um, I think what might be hardest with us composers is we put so much time and effort in color and timbre, because that's our like composer alchemy right there. But we just need to let it go. And you know, it'll still be music and it'll still be people coming together. And there are lots of other musical things you still can't control. And there's some things we can't control, like COVID and apparently people wearing masks and we can't control who's gonna be on the ensemble. No one can plan their seasons right now, but just to just, you know, maybe good things will still happen and just to kind of have that attitude and, and let things happen. Yay. Thanks, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> that was beautiful. Uh, um, the, the piece that I wrote uh, for, for Flex, actually, I came up with the idea about a year ago before, you know, back in the old world, before we knew that everything was going to anyway so um <laughs> and this seemed like the perfect opportunity because it's it's basically a jazz combo tune and i don't care how much jazz experience you have you can get you some in this piece and that, that's all i've ever wanted in a wind ensemble when i'm saying wind ensemble but it doesn't even have to be it's literally any five combination of instruments and like 
uh, like a condensed rhythm section. Like anybody, if you've ever, there is no such thing as a jazz instrument. You have, like, we have to, first of all, internalize that, right? It's not just trumpet, trombone, and saxes. Like, the, it's, it's the music that comes out of you, that's, that's, the, that's the medium, right? So, like, the bassoon player can get them some, and they can take a blues solo, because I lay it out, right? And they can have a good time. And your tuba player can get some, and your oboe player can get some as well. Like, everybody can get a piece, right? It doesn't matter. It just seemed like the perfect opportunity to put that together. So I'm really hoping that people run with this idea. And I, and I know it's intimidating at first, and I tried to make an improvisation guide to kind of just guide you through. It's all about, um, it's all about pitch limitation, right? Like, it's like, oh, God, improvisation, I can do anything. Yes, you can do anything, but that doesn't mean you have to do it all, right? So start with these three notes first, and then expand from there. So I'm really hoping that everybody leans into it. I even have opportunities for you guys to create your own background riffs, I give you a listening guide of things you can listen to. I suggest transcriptions, you know, because this is, if you want to learn the language of jazz, just like any language that you learn, you don't learn how to speak by reading first. You imitate, right? So just get your ears in the game. You can get your eyes off the page sometimes and just like interact with each other. So this flex uh, thing that we're dealing with now was a perfect opportunity to just kind of lean into that. And, um, and I'm just kind of hoping everybody runs with that opportunity. I'm just going to quickly say that Omar's new piece slaps. And also <laughs> I love that there's improv because this is a perfect opportunity to like make these decisions to like teach improv in the schools and to teach students real-time composing it's something that yeah. we've been needing for like our cms guidelines mm -hmm. and for like educational guidelines everywhere like y'all yeah. need to compose improvise you don't have to make all the choices just make some and have fun with it all right. yes we just have to read thank you for that we just have to redefine what it means to improvise it's not you standing out on the front of the stage alone for eight minutes like cutting a blue note album it doesn't have to be that you know, so just take your time with it and enjoy making, enjoy making the music, right? Like, like what is the music that's inside of you? Like, if you had no music in front of you right now, and somebody told you to play something, would you just play like the eight tunes that you had memorized? Because that's not you, you realize, right? That's, that's some other composer who wrote this thing you're playing. So this is a great opportunity now that we probably won't have 40, 50 people on the stage. You will only have like 10, 9, 8, 7 people in the room. This is a perfect opportunity to just like work on the music that's inside of us and developing that sound. So like that aspect of this, I'm really trying to find the, the joy in 2020, everybody. So I'm being foolishly optimistic right now. See Paris behind me? I was supposed to be there and I'm not because of COVID. So I'm just trying to find joy <laughs> in other places. And I feel like this is an opportunity. Jen, I'm trying. You know what? I'm going to pass it on to somebody else because I'm in my feelings now. It's fine. <laughs> Go. <laughs> I guess I can jump in. Um, yes, right. Yeah, it's uh, arranging some of my pre-existing music for Flexbane has been really challenging because I think so much about the color of all the instruments and about how am I combining it in all these different ways and keeping variety through the piece because that's part of what makes the shape of my piece work to me. Um, but it really has helped me distill down what's the most important thing about the music. How can I make it five or six total parts and still say what I want it to say? And that's been um, you know, really rewarding to me to kind of get to know my music in a new way from that. Um, now, some of the pieces I've transcribed are actually originally for other mediums uh, before they were wind band pieces. Uh, or orchestra pieces, and so uh, they might already have that seed in there where it's it's already been flexible from the first time I transcribed it. And uh, then I think this the next big challenge for me has been, especially coming not from uh, playing any wind instruments or brass instruments, uh, getting to know the techniques. And so now I've got a part that has to be played by a euphonium, a trombone, a bass clarinet, and potentially a tenor sax or whatever combinations it might end up being and how do I have one line that works for all of those and I don't have to change the octave of every other note just to fit it in their ranges or something um, and so I think it's going to make it rewarding for everyone especially the people who are used to playing whole notes uh, mm -hmm. now they will definitely get something other than whole notes uh, because I've only got so many parts and 
I don't have room for whole notes anymore when everyone's got these lines. I already tend to think contrapuntally. So um, hopefully it'll be rewarding. And now this piece that used to be for 50 people can also be played by six or seven. Um, and I think that completely changes the intimacy uh, of what the music is. Um, and I think that's a great thing. And, and uh, you know, the, the performers can really connect to each other in a way that they wouldn't have uh, if they were in a, a room full of 50 people. Uh, and so I think they'll, they'll start to explore not just their part, but be able to listen to all the other parts and react um, to these chamber experiences when maybe they only would have had uh, large ensemble experiences before. So uh, it's, it's been a great challenge and I've really enjoyed uh, doing it. And I'm going to keep on enjoying doing more of these as time goes on, uh, not just during the pandemic, but also in, in the future once we get back to a new normal. I'd love to jump in. I, I love what Creative Repertoire Initiative is doing. Absolutely. Uh, and, and those that know Technoblade, that's going to be released soon as a, an adaptable uh, piece that works perfectly because it's already got the electronic track. I'm really excited for that. Um, but even more, what, what I've been working on currently, uh, so here in the next uh, three weeks, two premieres will happen. They'll, they'll both be virtual uh, performances, pieces written specifically for large ensembles to be rehearsed and performed virtually. Uh, one's for the Greater Indianapolis Youth Orchestra, and then one's for uh, Music Creators Academy, which if you haven't seen the info on that, me and a bunch of other uh, composers that I consider my dream team in a lot of ways, uh, got together and made that. And so we'll be making music with high school and middle school students on Zoom, asynchronously, as well as synchronous pieces with electronic tracks. And so I'm currently, so I, I'm currently working on a piece all about how, uh, based on my kids' joy of Legos and how Legos are little building blocks. And so it's, it's a piece that involves a lot of composition on behalf of the students within a, a structure, you know, with, within defined uh, a, a skeleton, if you will, of a piece. And then they're filling it in with, with um, with some pre-composition as well as improvisatory things in the final performance. And there's a lot of visuals. The other piece is called Snitching in the Kitchen. And just to give you a taste of, of that, uh, you know, the, performan the performers, in addition to playing their instruments, of course, in the kitchen with aprons on, chef hats, napkin tucked in the shirt, you know, those kind of, those kind of visuals. Uh, they're, they're grabbing a kitchen implement of their choice at one part you know, setting down their instrument, grabbing this kitchen implement and contributing in a, in a tasteful way to the groove that's happening in the electronic track in an ostinato type of way, not a soloistic way. Um, there's another part where they're, they're told, uh, you know, with your, six, with your section, uh, you're, you're doing this little background, you're singing snitching in the kitchen, snitching in the kitchen, this little harmonized thing. And they're told uh, that with their section leader's guidance, they're gonna choreograph something visual for those eight bars, you know, and, and they're on the Zoom, you know, this final recorded performance in these little boxes. And it's been really interesting because the students have come up with some really cool creative ways to use this new space of this little cube and the fact that I can pass something to the person next to me and then grab that and pass it. And anyway, they're coming up with some really cool stuff. And that has been really encouraging for me to see that we can we can empower the next generation not only to keep playing music in social distance pandemic era but to, to create their own and and you know to to find their own voices with within <laughs> within some parameters to guide them and give them the encouragement so that's what i'm most excited about right now i actually have a question about that i haven't I haven't started doing a uh, flex piece yet, but are any of you working on one for like, I don't know, advanced high school or college ensembles? Like, like a flex band piece? And if so, how would yeah. you approach that? I've I been doing, everything I've done so far has been grade three and up, um, including uh, my, the first one that I did, Mari Trinkley taught is it's now grade five instead of four in its, octet it's chamber octet with flex options because now the parts are so exposed 
Um, and the flute part, you know, covers a much bigger range than it did before. And so I think it's really important for us to have not just grades one through one and two, but also grades three through six flex uh, things and chamber wins as well. Um, and, you know, my wife is uh, an orchestra director and she's been working with her colleagues um, trying to figure out how many people can they fit in their rehearsal space. And it's, you know, it's so few. And with the studies coming out now, we're just not sure what it's going to look like, but it's definitely going to look like fewer people in the room. And so having good options, uh, like if you have a band with 60 people in it and you want them to play some of the same rep and you can only have 10 to 15 in a room at a time, the flex option gives you that possibility to rehearse in 15 person groups. And then maybe you do your concert outdoors when everyone can finally come together. Um, and then you haven't lost rehearsal time uh, through all that. So yeah, I'm, I'm definitely, uh, I think I'm doing six part plus percussion mainly. Um, and so there's more independence of color between the parts. I, I'm able to have some lines that aren't um, set as much of a mix of different colors. Um, and so there, I can have a woodwind only uh, part, but then I have more parts and that's gonna be, that should be fine for the kinds of numbers that I'm seeing uh, fitting in rehearsal spaces. And then having a grade five and a grade six kind of flex thing makes perfect sense for, uh, definitely for this next semester. I was, yeah, I'm just gonna quickly, Go ahead. I'm done. Well, I was Go just going to quickly add to that, to what Roger was saying. Something that was talked about with CRA was definitely this issue, and it's specifically um, in Japan, where they're having, like, they actually don't have the numbers to have these full bands anymore, just because of how the population decrease has been happening. And so uh, Julie Giroux was, like, really encouraging a lot of us to do these flex bands with the greater, with the, the greater levels because there is demand for this type of music. And the website does have a resource of how like the Japanese flex band system works. So if you want to do stuff internationally, which you know we are WASB right now. So um, but but yeah, that would I would check out those resources because I can't I can't help you just so. <laughs> I think maybe what I struggle with is becoming way too attached to the original sound of a piece. <laughs> and like, well, I, I can't, I can't mess with this. This is my work, you know? <laughs> well, maybe uh, conceive of something that's not for, uh, that's specifically for small instrumentation and not an adaptation. Because an adaptation may not work and that's fine, you know? Uh, so just try to write something at the beginning um, where your, your, your frame is already going to be a smaller instrumentation. Mm -hmm. And don't feel like you have to pare things down from something that already exists. Anyone else want to add anything? All right. So, um, so as we're as we're starting to see the the winding down a little bit of time here, I would be curious just to ask some quick like one answer questions for all y'all to share. We one around like, for example, um, who or what is like your big inspiration to what you write? Like, if it's a certain composer or if it's art or what what is your inspiration? I mean, I can't think of anything right now. I would say that um, since we're all isolated, although um, to answer both your question and Jess's question, like I've been thinking a lot of like Louis Andreessen's music because of the, like the flexible ensemble, like, and in a way, like the ensembles that come together just very like democratic because it's like he got some really cool instrumental uh, combina combinations from that, you know, where it's like saxophone, guitar, and a lot of metal and a lot of angry minimalism, but I guess we can't use that word right now, or we can, I don't know. Um, but um, on that note, seriously, I guess, um, I've been thinking a lot about space because they're isolated and we're isolated and it's lonely. So if my piece for Michigan State comes up very sad, that is why. Hmm. Oh, oh, right, I'm sorry, that's on me. Um, so wait. The question was, was, was it about this specific moment or in general? Just in general, what's your, what's your driving inspiration? Oh, God. Um, can I pass? <laughs> That's actually not serious. Sure, sure, you bet. I'm passing the ball. Okay, so um, 
<laughs> I'm going to give kind of a non-answer too. Uh, I mean, what, I, I come back to teaching, I think, a lot because it's sort of a way for me to work out my own artistic process and and um, and see if I can help someone else work through theirs. So um, one of the things I think about a lot is just that as a person, I'm continually changing. I think about pieces that I hear for the first time and hated or loved and then come back later and loved or hated. Um, and those pieces didn't change, I did. And so um, I guess a goal for me is to be changing enough as a human to be reading new things and hearing new things and meeting new people and having new experiences often enough that I don't have a thing I go to every single time for 40 years. Um, there are certainly aspects of my artistic identity that I trust. Um, and there are, I guess, key pieces or composers that I may continue to revisit. But um, for me, it's actually about kind of finding something new each time, something that causes me to think a little differently for every little season of life. Um, so I'll leave that non-answer there. <laughs> it's not a non-answer, dude. Are you kidding me? <laughs> that was a good answer. No, I, good. I'm inspired by whatever I find interesting at the time. And I mean, there's certain things I like a lot, like uh, nature and science and uh, math, but I just wrote a piece that's kind of about linguistics and, and other pieces about you know, whatever. It's just anything that I'm interested in at the time. I love that music can describe things that aren't necessarily just music, um, but it can really connect to emotions and to images and to uh, anything you really want to describe. There's, there's probably a musical way to do that, and I love that challenge of just searching for that. So uh, that's, you know, every piece that I write is going to be about something slightly different, and, and I love that I can explore the things I love outside of music by composing. Okay, I'm ready now. Um, so I think that my my driving force right now is about representation and it's also about de-siloing of styles right and really challenging myself to get um kind of my wind ensemble brain and my big band brain to talk to to become one and to see just how far i can push that um and so that's kind of where i am and i feel like viet was taking in air and then i opened my mouth and then he remuted viet go I'd, I'd say uh, pretty similar to Dave. Um, like if I just need like a one word answer, it would just be like SoundCloud. I just love sitting on SoundCloud and like just seeing what people are creating, what sounds they're making. Um, and in my music recently, I just really like to uh, kind of imitate other music or like, like I have this like new piece that's like a Baroque inspired piece where I like tried to become a Baroque composer. Um, and so I like actually really enjoy like listening to Vivaldi concertos like ad the nauseum. Baroque composers used uh, multiphonics, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> so you're referencing like, a piece for oboes. And if orchestra. they're being extra fancy. Yeah, so it's like a double oboe concerto. Um, but uh, so like when I was writing that piece, I just loved I would sit on YouTube, like, and they have these YouTube playlists with, like, every Vivaldi concerto that he wrote. <laughs> I would just, like, listen to all of them and look at them on IMSLP and just try to learn what I didn't learn in school about, like, that side of Baroque music. So I, I try to just be a sponge for everything. Yeah, I think it's the same for me too. I actually draw a lot of um, inspiration just from like sounds outside, kind of like a messy in kind of way. Like if I hear the bus stop outside, there's this really, really high piccolo pitch and then like this puff of air from like horns, <laughs> you know, or something like that. I can, I hear, I like to hear all that stuff kind of, um, I've got the bird feeders outside my window. And some days that ends up in my music too, because they scream all day and <laughs> fight and I can't concentrate. Um, but you know, it's stuff like that. Like I make sure, I try to make sure I never have headphones on when I'm walking around outside. Because um, number one, if there's an emergency, all the people with headphones, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and number two, <laughs> I love to just hear the sounds that are around us. And even if you can't put them into music, you can at least allude to them um, Maybe I'm talking about impressionism, <laughs> obliquely, kind of. 
but yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just kind of everyday sounds. I like to get other people's sounds out of my head while I'm outside um, and just hear what the rest of the world kind of has to say. So I, I get this question a lot, especially when I, you know, when we're working with bands, I'm sure you guys all do too. Uh, you know, uh, they want to know like what composers, you know, are most inspirational to me or whatever. And honestly, I don't, I don't listen to music in the way of like, um, oh, I want to learn from that and dissect that. And, and, and I want to copy that and transcribe that. And like, I mean, I mean, sometimes, yes, I, I am, but most of the time my musical listening is enjoyment and just, you know, I'm listening to these pieces cause I enjoy it. And, and so it's not directly influencing my writing. I would say what's influencing my writing more is, uh, kind of like what Roger said, you know, something in my life, or, or, and this goes to Dave's comment too, I guess, something in my life has got my attention. Uh, you know, I heard a news article about how we're all like digital goldfish. And then I write this sax quartet piece called Digital Goldfish, or I, I'm out throwing my throwing knives and I'm like, oh, dude, I should record this and make Technoblade. Or, you know, that's, that's the way that it works for me is like, I can't really find the inspiration. It, I just kind of have to like, chill with life and then i'm like oh i should write a piece about snitching in the kitchen and about stealing brownie batter out of the bowl like so yeah that's that's how it hits me <laughs> and yes having children actually is huge <laughs> they make the funnest sounds <laughs> and i got lots of those <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so here's a question uh, that uh, Colleen wanted me to ask, and I think it's a great question. Um, of your music, what wind band piece, if, if you have one that you've written, is underplayed, but it's like one of your favorites you wish people would play more? Are these pieces that like a lot of people can play? <laughs> or like, because... <laughs> I think my favorite piece that doesn't get played is one that <laughs> not many people can play. Uh, Brass Quintet Concerto, Deep Calls to Teep. Um, it's about New Orleans, Hurricane Katrina, um, written for the 10 year anniversary. And I'm from that area of the country, the Deep South. And so, yeah, there's a lot of, of blues and, and stuff like that in it. And yeah, no one can play it because it's like huge and you have to have a brass quintet where everybody's amazing. <laughs> It was written for the Boston Brass, so um, yeah, that's definitely uh, one for me. <laughs> when I first saw that question pop up, I thought it was kind of an in general thing, and so that's what I was prepared to answer in my mind, but so I'm going to answer that question. I hope that's okay. Dwayne Milburn's American Hymn Song Suite, specifically the second movement, there's a Balm and Gilead. That... Mm -hmm is completely sublime and it's a transcription of a jazz organist performance of that piece his name is joe utterback and his transcription of that is just so perfect talk about translating colors and it's just beautiful it sounds like bob brookmeyer's music but it's one ensemble and it's organ and it's and i'm like nobody nobody seems to ever <laughs> do this piece and it's like two and a half minutes that you just get lost in so the whole, whole suite is great, but that second movement, there's a bomb in Gilead, it's just everything to me. I listen to it sometimes five times in a row, and just close my eyes and lay on the couch, and uh, it's amazing. Roger, how about you? Oh, of, of pieces that I've written or in general, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, there's a piece that I wrote that actually just finished making a flex band arrangement that I, I wish I could hear more called December Lullaby. Um, and it's, it's only been played a couple of times. And uh, I wrote it uh, many years ago. It was originally a, um, it was originally a piece that I wrote uh, for some of my close friends. And then I made uh, a band version of it recently and it was during a really tough time. And so uh, I think I was able to get out of that tough time by just thinking about the friends that I wrote it for, um, and the, you know, the, just the relationships that, that make us who we are, um, and that bring warmth to our lives, even though it's called December Lullaby, it really is about warmth. Um, and so 
that I think I feel like that's the piece that um, I'd like to have get out there as as much as any uh, of my own works. So first I'll answer with the jazz big band piece. <laughs> I have a work called uh, No Improv Monday that I think it's, a, it's a, such a fun work and it doesn't get done very much, but that's okay. Uh, not as nearly as much as some of the others. For concert band, I'm gonna go ahead and say uh, Trailing Clouds of Glory, which actually Daryl Brown helped be a part of that commission and helped me start getting right, you know, working with wind ensembles. So thank you, Daryl. Viet, how about you? Uh, I mean, for my own music, I don't really know. I mean, I have, I think my favorite wind ensemble piece I've written is my percussion quartet concerto renewal, which hasn't been played much because it's pretty new. Um, so, I don't know when, we, when I'll be able to be done again, but, uh, and for like piece, like a band piece that, um, I think isn't perform. You know, I don't know if this counts, but and John Adams also doesn't need any more performances. He's doing fine. But I really one of my favorite pieces is Grand Pianola music, um, which is kind of. I mean, there's no strings, and right, there's no strings, and but it's like for two pianos, <laughs> so it's just it's not practical. But like the accompaniment is, I think it just wins in percussion and maybe some. Mm -hmm. voices. Um, that's one of my favorite pieces, um, especially by him. Three, three, three amplified voices. Yeah. Uh, so, I don't know, I, I, I kind of wonder why it's not like programmed on band class. I mean, I know why, because getting two pianos on stage is not easy, but, you know, if, if you ever just are looking for a piece for wins and two pianos, <laughs> look at that one. I've played the first trumpet part to that piece. It's it's intense, <laughs> like just nonstop. We play intense music all the time. Oh know? yeah, I mean I made it. <laughs> I made it through, and it was fantastic. Yeah. I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's an awesome piece. Is Jennifer still with us, or did she have to jump off already? I mean, I'm still. I, okay, so is the question like? A, p a band piece of yours that you wish you would be run with it. Do what you want. Just run with Do it. Do what I want. Um, okay. Well, I might as well plug a piece that no one plays. Um, but I actually, uh, it was my second Wind Ensemble piece. It's called uh, Through the Looking Glass Falls. And I actually wrote it in conjunction with Brevard College and Brevard Elementary. And the reason why I like it is because um, I taught the local elementary students about graphic scores. And then, um, and one thing about Brevard is there are a whole bunch of waterfalls. And I had them listen to uh, Ravel's Jido, which is translates to water games. And I said, and then write what you hear, but graphic scores as much as you can. And uh, what I ended up doing was taking their, um, their drawings and I still have them. And the few performances of this piece, if they have them, they like project what the students wrote as their graphic scores and then I translated them. Um, I think the reason why it doesn't get performed that often is because it's very exposed and difficult because it was very pointillistic and it's not bandy. Um, but, um, but like I had a lot of fun writing it and uh, who knew that it was a grade five piece? <laughs> 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 but um, I think, you know, uh, back to what uh, Ben said about like working with students, it's just so satisfying and I really, I really love the premiere of that piece because the kids came and they had little meme tags. And um, one of the pieces like I did as like a processional and a recessional kind of like pictures at an exhibition. Um, granted the, the mom, the daughter, the, the kid's mom was like, I'm so glad you chose my daughter's piece twice. And I'm like, no, it just, mm, okay. But cool, yeah, you know, I, I just smiled and nodded. But um, yeah, Through the Looking Glass Falls. I, I think the Detroit Youth uh, Wind Ensemble did it with, with Ken Thompson. Um, he's a good guy, so um, that's my answer. Am I up? I think I'm last, yeah. yeah. Um, so um, two, uh, two of my pieces, real quickly, I'll just kind of 
pitch. One is uh, like it's a grade three piece called Ghost Apparatus, and um, I you know I'm gleaning. I I knew this, but it's good to be reminded. There's a lot of a lot of uh, energy behind inspiration in this group, and um, Ghost Apparatus uh, calls on the ensemble to um, improvise and actually specifically to find non uh, non pitched or strangely pitched. Uh, elements of their instruments, which, which I think is kind of fun to improvise a lot with timbre um, and and find the things that they often find uh, in warm-ups, um, among other things. Uh, the other piece that uh, is really dear to me as, artistically is called Cyclotron. And it's a difficult work, but it's sort of one of those pieces where I just like found sounds and worlds in my own work that that I wasn't sure were possible. and. And I'm really proud of it, and it's 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 for it's for band, and um, so those those are two pieces that that mean a lot to me. Fantastic, thank you. I I just thought of one piece that's not by me, but a piece that I don't see performed really ever. That's a band piece is by a Japanese composer Dai Fujikara, mm. um, called My Butterflies. My Butterflies, it's so good. It's, it's like the most amazing, amazing, like incredible, show stopping, never been done, like like use of color um and there's like a score follower video i love that there's like score follower video for this piece but um it's on like just find the video of it on youtube it's an amazing piece fantastic um thank you all so we're kind of we're at the end of our time jennifer's got to go teach um so can we get uh can we get like a do you have any parting thoughts anybody anything you want to share with this group of people Maybe Jen should go first if she's got to go. Oh, I guess if I, well, I just text my students saying I'm, I'm running over, but um, I like thinking that we could all get through this together. I think there is like a silver lining in that, like we get to see people through Zoom. I'm thankful to see my blue daughters. It's been a while. It's been a minute um, and happy to be here. And uh, yeah, we can, I think we can do this. I think that we as humans are creatives. Whether we're composers or not, I think we as humans are naturally creative and I think we'll get through it. Although we might need like a lot of booze and a lot of therapy, but I'm happy to see you all. Um, or brownie part, part batter, shot. <laughs> My parting shot is that I'm kind of done being mad at 2020 and I'm kind of leaning into the opportunities that it's presenting us now. Um, and, and so I encourage everybody to find those opportunities as uncomfortable as they may be. And just now is the time to, to bury yourself in that discomfort so that you can emerge. We can all emerge collectively better on the other side of this madness. Um, yeah. I think for me, I'm, I'm trying not to write music that's too influenced by fear or anger right now. Uh, you know, two very strong emotions that are everywhere. Um, you know, um, so just trying to, I mean, it's not that we can't see those things, those emotions and, and use them in our music. Um, I'm trying just really hard not to be controlled by it and to write things that transcend, <clears throat> transcend the moment rather than. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. I can go next. <laughs> um, I'm I'm really hoping that I'll be where Omar is soon in terms of uh, attitude about things. I have to admit, I mean, one of the reasons I don't have a flex piece is because um, I just uh, I'm still kind of reeling. Um, you know, um, I've had a hard time writing. I've had a really hard time writing, and um, I one of the big reasons that I write is to connect with people. Um, I mean, that's, I actually think I understand that more deeply than ever um, now because uh, I have some pieces that I guess I need to write, but the premieres are uncertain. And um, uh, I guess just the, the prospect that, you know, that I'm not going to be able to connect with the people, the humans for which this music is, that we're made to make together is just really hard. So, um, uh, I'm going to I'm going to take that but I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to say I'd like Omar's comments to be a, a coda because I really want to aim for that to find this positivity and and I just to just to end with saying that I'm grateful for my colleagues in Blue Dot and for their energy 
for their leadership and, and I'm hoping to follow them a bit. And, uh, and for all of you that I know are faced with incredibly difficult situations for you know a plethora of reasons, um, just to kind of say from one music maker to another, like, I see you, uh, this is hard, but um, let's do this together. And um, yeah, love you all. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, what we've lost has really made us appreciate what we have um, and force us to be creative in ways to try to, you know, create this in as best we can. And I've, I've been pretty pessimistic about what's actually been happening, but I've tried to stay optimistic in looking towards the future um, and, and what creativity I'm trying to get out of this. Uh, it's been really hard to write, but it's, you know, it's great to see the community you know, really um, making strides to try to make something happen, even though uh, we really don't know what's going to be happening in three weeks, even. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's been very heartwarming to, to see this. It's been so great to see all the rest of uh, my colleagues here and, and so many people uh, on this call. Uh, we can't forget that we're humans and that humans need to connect to other humans. I'll say, like, uh, the last four months has been crazy. I mean, that goes without saying, but just like, it's been really hard to write music the last four months for me. Um, and just like, I just like watched these things that I feel like I've worked my whole life for just kind of vanish. Um, and so that's been hard. Um, but you know, I also think that this community and music is what really helped me get through like the hardest years of my life when I was like 15. And it's gonna do the same thing now if we just kind of stay together as community and we'll get through it. How am I supposed to follow? <laughs> uh, I, love, I, I love my colleagues at Blue Dot because they're so articulate and so deep and uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm really grateful to be associated with these wonderful composers and, and all of you for your support of being here on this call. I, I definitely echo the words of my colleagues. I, I do, I feel like it was a couple months ago where the, the, the shift happened inside of me. <laughs> it was while I was writing a snitch in the kitchen, actually, um, of, of, realizing, well, wait a minute, I can still write music. I can still connect with students playing music. Yes, it's, it's going to be a totally different paradigm. It's going to have pros and cons compared to the old world, as Omar likes to call it, which I really like. I'm going to adopt that, Omar. Um, and, and so let's embrace the opportunities that it does provide. And that's, that's, what I'm, that's where I'm headed. That's what I'm doing. So thanks, guys. Thanks, Daryl. Huge thank you to all of you from Blue Dot for joining us. Um, all amazing composers um, doing great work, and we're grateful that you are writing music for us. Um, and soon enough, hopefully, we'll all be able to do it in person again. Yeah.